Welcome to this episode of Table Talk by the Indian Animal Studies Collective. We are a group of um, scholars, academics, and activists, basically anybody who's interested in the question of the animal. Um, and uh, we engage with scholars from the field, discussing texts that they've written, the work that they've done, in trying to figure out our own position towards animals. I'm delighted and honored to have as our guest, Martin Ulrich from the Nuremberg University of Music today. We will be talking to Martin about his article between philology and biology, animal music and its epistemological and methodological framework. So Martin, a very hearty welcome to you to this edition of the Table Talk. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm, I'm delighted uh, to be here and um, um, you have uh, had those awesome uh, talks with uh, so interesting and prominent guests. I'm really honored to be part of this um, and uh, I'm looking forward to our talk. Okay. So before we start in earnest with our questions and um, other kinds of remarks um, on Martin's work and the overall question of music and animals. I would just like to mention for the, uh, uh, for the benefit of all the others who are here, that we conceptualize these table talks as very informal conversations. So everybody is welcome to join in with their questions, their comments, their remarks, anything at all really. Please just raise your hand or uh, put it in the chat box, whatever you are more comfortable with at any point of time during this event. Um, it will be approximately an hour um, that we will be talking to Martin. So looking forward to everybody's participation here. Let's start Martin with the fundamental aesthetic question of whether the sounds produced by non-human animals can be understood as music. Um, so what is it that determines in present times whether something is music at all or just an utterance? And um, I focus here on the present times thing because I was reading your other article also in um, Tiere Kultur Wissenschaftliches Handbuch where you have uh, uh, sort of traced the evolution of the animal in music from, um, from earlier epochs until the present time. So, what is it? How do we understand music right now? I think that's a very interesting question and it might be much more difficult to answer uh, than at first glance um, because um, I sometimes get the impression that um, in um, academia and also in, in the um, public discourse, um, it's, it often seems to be taken for granted that we all know what music is. So there seems to be this idea of a common understanding um, uh, uh, that we can grasp intuitively and without too much reasoning what music is or what uh, what is not music. And um, if you um, dig a bit deeper uh, and uh, if you try to deconstruct this, then um, uh, you often get the impression that it's totally not clear what music is. I have to admit that um, um, the article um, uh, we are talking today about is, is a few years old. I have to admit that I'm switching um, uh, to, um, to uh, musics instead of music um, because this general singular of music, uh, it's, it's comparable to the critique by Jacques Derrida on the general singular of the animal, uh, which takes for granted that there is such a thing as the animal and we all know what an animal is and what an animal, uh, um, uh, uh, how an animal differs from, from uh, humans. Uh, and, and there is an analogy to music as well. So um, uh, meanwhile, I've started to, to uh, adopt um, uh, uh, this term of musics to just uh, recognize and realize that there is no such thing as the music. And, and this is one thing I, I tried to outline in the article, even if, if I'm talking about music there, but I'm talking a lot about the, the ingrained Eurocentrism of this concept of a music um, which is uh, universally understood and um, 
which is like spread all over the world, but uh, in the end, um, uh, um, it originates uh, from Europe, from a, a, you know Eurocentric uh, culture, and and um, if we are thinking uh, about and with animal musics, um, this question of um, how do we define music, can we define it at all, um, uh, becomes uh, 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 much more you know uh, urgent uh, than if we are talking about uh, some. Uh, very well known uh, works of art from the from the european uh, uh, art music uh, canon um, we, we, we can take an, a, an easy approach um, we can stick to um, 20th century avant-garde composers like uh, edgar Varese or john cage and we can say music is just organized sound but um, uh, as uh, tempting uh, uh, this approach is, it, it doesn't um, uh, uh, it present us with a solution uh, when it comes to the problem of animal musics, um, uh, because then we uh, again are uh, like trapped into this, you know, um, uh, human exceptionalism uh, that would say um, music is what we as humans hear and uh, recognize as music um, and um, uh, I get some, sometimes I get the impression that uh, right now um, and recently, interestingly, the natural sciences sometimes are more open to acknowledging non-human musics, uh, to grant that non-human animals have music than um, my own field, musicology, uh, um, uh, would be. Um, so this, this is one thing that makes it at the same time interesting and difficult to talk about uh, what we think of music because biologists might be very open to the idea that birds, whales, maybe even insects have music and talk about animal song and animal music, but at the same time might not reflect so much about this term and what it brings uh, with it. Um, so there, there is a, um, uh, there is much need of interdisciplinary dialogue and understanding um, and uh, I think the future of the uh, research on animal music lies in the in the cooperation of um, very different fields of uh, research uh, and of approach um, and and uh, of uh, bringing together um, scientific and scholarly uh, thinking about music. Yeah, um, you know, what you said right now, um, it just made me think of something that happened recently in India. So uh, there was this uh, really renowned Indian singer called Lata Mangeshkar, who died um, last week, I think. And uh, practically all the obituaries and condolence messages that one got to read about invoked a title that she had informally been bestowed with. Uh, so she was called the Nightingale of India. Mm -hmm. And I found it really remarkable that the nightingale is invoked here to draw attention to how melodious and gifted a singer she was. And yet most people would tend to associate music exclusively with humans, you know, and uh, not with, uh, with other non-human animals, including birds for that matter. But getting back to the question of um, what is music? and what is not music. And I really like what you just said about there, you know, being uh, this alternative term, um, music, which then makes much better sense. Um, I was also reading about the work of someone else that we are going to be uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sorry, somebody's phone is ringing perhaps. Yeah, I muted that person, it's fine. All right, great, thank you. So I was reading about the work um, of one of our future guests who's worked on um, the tribal communities in Northeast India, uh, including the Khamtis, who capture um, wild elephants and work with them. So they start out by training these newly captured elephants. And the Khamtis and other tribal communities use music quite actively in the first part of the training process. You know, while the elephants are still wild and they are not yet used to humans, they start out with music. And um, when we speak about interspecies communication, 
what would then be, for example, in this case, the difference between voices as in, you know, the commands perhaps that the humans use to train the animal, um, other sounds and melodies, which would be a part of the music that they use to train the animals. How would one say this is where one end, this is where one ends and the other one starts, you know, just voices as in commands, other sounds and melodies. How would those work differently upon animals? Yeah, uh, interesting. I, I think your question has like two, two angles. Um, the one is um, uh, this uh, difference or maybe gradual continuity between call and song uh, or um, um, spoken voice and uh, sung melody. And the other is the very special human animal relationship when it comes to music for elephants. That's that's a chapter of its own. I, I've actually published another piece on that. So um, uh, it's uh, really uh, um, uh, open doors for me. Um, it, it, the first point, um, I think we are used to um, put um, um, call and song um, command and melody in two separate um, uh, categories. But um, alternatively, we could think about seeing them as um, two extremes of a gradual field. And um, evolutionary biology um, has often um, hypothesized about um, a, a, a shared root of verbal language on one hand and uh, song and melody on the other hand. Um, uh, even Charles Darwin said that um, uh, the verbal language of uh, humans might have derived from imitating like um, bird songs uh, and animal calls. Um, so maybe there's a like evolutionary continuum. And then um, it might depend not so much on the phenomenon itself, but on the social uh, interaction uh, in which it occurs. Um, uh, just as you said, Anu, um, if um, uh, humans want to command and direct elephants, they would themselves uh, frame this as a command, as shouting or, or uh, a talking. And if they want to like um, uh, appease or, or uh, relax them, they might sing or play music. Um, so it's maybe um, more important which kind of social interaction takes place and how uh, tension or, or how much tension or, or relaxation we have in this interaction. But um, the phenomenon itself, um, I, I've talked with some um, uh, colleagues uh, who do um, research on, on orcas. Um, and um, very often in the literature, you, you read that orcas just have calls. So in this categorical difference, they would speak but not sing. But um, uh, if, if you uh, take a closer look um, and if you listen um, uh, closer, uh, then you have um, uh, a short uh, calls or words um, when they are active, when they are hunting, when they are cooperating um, very actively. And when they uh, relax and chill and have a leisure time, then they like chat and then th this sounds more like, you know, melody and music. Um, so uh, there seems to be a, a gradual continuum and at some point uh, we tend to, to frame this as more music or more uh, uh, language, um, um, but um, on, on a closer look it, it, it might be not so easy to, to draw a clear line. Um, uh, the other aspect of your question, uh, the human elephant relationship, uh, which is mediated through music, um, is in my eyes a very, very ambiguous thing uh, because um, music sometimes is used to, to communicate with elephants and, and to, to try to, to, um, um, to, to interact positively with them. And, and my article is, um, among other aspects, um, on this um, uh, concert pianist, Paul Barton, who travels, uh, who travels um, uh, Southeast Asia to play uh, Western piano music to um, former working elephants. 
and and it's it's a kind of uh, 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 for him it's kind of a reconciliation process because he has this you know um, he he has this consciousness that that elephants have been nearly driven to extinction um, for ivory and and uh, uh, a lot of this ivory. Um, uh, found its way on the on the keys of European uh, and Western pianos. So um, elephants have have deeply suffered in the past uh, from uh, uh, European uh, uh, music culture, and and he wants to you know uh, uh, reconciliate and and to do something good now for the elephants. And on the other hand, um, he's playing. Um, Western uh, music, Beethoven uh, and Chopin. And, and it, the fascinating thing is that the elephants, um, some of the elephants actually seem to like it and seem to respond. So maybe there's an intercultural exchange going on as well. But there is another tradition to, um, to control and even oppress elephants by music. Um, if you look at the circus, if, if you if you look back to Roman antiquity in, in the arena, um, uh, elephants were killed or they had to, to move and to dance to music. So the, the, it's for me, it's a very ambiguous thing. And I, I don't want to criticize um, tribal practices, which have their own cultural tradition. But I, I, I really want to criticize the uh, the exploitation of elephants, uh, which is have been going on in, in in Western culture, in circuses and in zoological gardens for at least the last 150 uh, years, uh, and and music uh, was a, a big part of of um, controlling them and um, uh, and and um, exploiting them for for entertainment in, in uh, Western capitalist societies. I, I had a question. Um, Sorry, Anna. Uh, Susan, yeah, yeah. Uh, because you mentioned Barton, um, I had also come across criticism of the work that Barton has been doing, you know, of playing uh, classical Western classical music on pianos for um, elephants that used to be captive, because uh, there was a school of thought which said that actually these videos were doctored in the sense that the elephants were not free. They um, the videos were shot in such a way that you could not see the handler behind the elephant that was in some cases compelling the elephant to stay there uh, and that perhaps the elephant was not standing there listening to the music out of his own or her own free will but was being forced to perform for the camera and that this was a part of uh, the um, uh, because Barton had a book coming out or a video I forget which and therefore this was sort of like promotion for uh, for his upcoming publication and um, some amount of uh, you know some of some of the shots in the video do show uh, them being goaded or that you know when they seem to be swaying their heads it's not necessarily that it's because of the music it's this sort of stressful behavior reaction um, that's very typical of um, you know animals that are under stress Very true, and um, here we uh, tap into the field of what uh, nowadays is called interspecies music. Um, uh, so, if if you have you know musical exchange um, and um, uh, playing and listening situations between um, humans and non-human animals in music, there is again this wide range of um, people who just offer music to animals. There is, for example, um, uh, the German uh, artist um, uh, in fine arts, he's, he's an artist and sound artist, Marek Brandt, and he does, um, you know, music for, for example, uh, wildcats and, and uh, other uh, free roaming animals. And, and um, his concept includes that maybe the animals are not there when he, he does his sound art and his music. He, he, he offers them the music, but they choose to come or not, to go away, to hide or to show themselves. So uh, that's, that's a very, um, I would say, um, uh, a liberating concept of music with or for animals. And um, there are those other examples, um, very prominent examples, um, for example, by the, uh, uh, the, the example of the Thai Elephant Orchestra, which was, uh, founded in, in this uh, elephant sanctuary in northern 
Thailand, and it, it was like a follow-up project to the arts project uh, the the uh, Russian um, uh, artists Koma and Melamit did with the elephants. They were allowed to paint, and after that, there were musicians who trained them to to play. Um, they built elephant instruments of a very huge size and uh, very uh, stable, uh, uh, like mallet instruments, percussion instruments. And uh, this orchestra of elephants, uh, quite obviously, um, is uh, guided very much. Um, I've seen it myself, and you can see it on pictures and in uh, videos. There are the mahouts who like control and, and um, uh, monitor the elephants. Um, and and um, I mean, uh, this is. Um, this is more difficult uh, and and maybe not as appealing from an ethical point of view. And I'm very much for um, uh, bringing the aesthetic and the ethic realm together. But on the other hand, it's still a musical relation. So um, I think um, the the a, a very a, a very deep challenge in Barton's concept is that he brings this European Western music with him and supposes that the elephants must like it because the whole world must like it. And, and so um, it would be no wonder for me if it sometimes um, sh should be necessary to, you know, um, uh, um, control the elephants, um, because why shouldn't elephants walk away if, if <laughs> uh, <laughs> white European plays some Beethoven sonata for them? Um, I, I might I might um, shortly mention that um, this is one thing that that has been bothering me, bothering me in the last years that there are so many animal soundscapes um, we we don't even hear because they are out of our hear range they are not loud enough or too high or too low as in case of the elephants um, with their with their um, uh, infrasonic uh, communication or we don't bother to listen to because we are not interested in, we, we, we don't um, get close enough. Uh, maybe it's in another element, it's in the ocean, not in the air. And then we suppose there's no sound. Um, and and uh, this is a um, very certain um, kind of speciesism. And, and um, all those uh, experiments um, with uh, which in the end force um, um, uh, uh, Western music on uh, animals uh, all over the world just negate their own sound cultures in a way. So there is a, a very a general problem in all those settings. Uh, there's a question in the chat from uh, Juliana Fausto. She's asking, could you please repeat the name of the artist who plays for animals who may not be there? Yes, um, and I will put it in the chat as well because it's a German name and um, um, the spelling might not be self-explanatory. Um, it's Marek Brandt. He's based in Leipzig, Germany. And um, uh, yeah, sure, welcome. Susan, would you like to go with your question? Yes. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, Martin, um, in in when you're talking about interspecies music and so on, I noticed that one of the critiques you're making is also against human exceptionalism. And that is very much related to the idea we have of the opus or um, you know, the body of one's work and so on. So when we talk about animals, um, should, we, um, should we talk about individual animals making music or um, would there be a disadvantage of talking about, th about them as a species um, having sound cultures? Because I imagine if we are attributing sound cultures and musical um, attributes to an entire species, then, um, then I, su I suppose what we are also implying is that all of, all of these non-human animals belonging to a certain category are equally musically gifted, which is not true at all in the case of humans. Uh, I think this is a very important point you are making right now. And, and I have to admit that I am 
struggling with um, uh, with this question, um, um, and I'm not sure whether I can give a, um, a satisfactory uh, answer at all. But but um, um, uh, yes, um, I think you are um, totally right. Um, all when it comes to, and indeed not the case in for musical species like for example. In this piece we describe um, um, nightingales and this is in culture is much more important than than the um, than the genetic element. So um, uh, it's not only that not all nightingales all over the world are equally musically gifted, but that they have like regional dialects that they depend on learning phases in their early childhood um, on teaching uh, in, in an emphatic sense. They have to listen to like their, their uh, parents or um, other surrounding nightingales to, to really uh, develop their own songs. Um, and um, in the end, you have um, the species, uh, the uh, regional group, um, and the individual animal, and and this is really one thing which, uh, yeah, I've I've been struggling with um, for years. Um, on the one hand, I very much sympathize with a concept like uh, that of uh, French philosopher Dominique Lestel, who has um, published on animal music as well, um, of of what he calls uh, l'animal singulier, the the singular animal. And he emphasizes very much that there might be this one orangutan who is so gifted um, uh, uh, in making knots or um, opening doors. Um, uh, and, and we could say there is this one nightingale which is so gifted uh, in, in singing so, so many uh, uh, verses and songs. Um, uh, I very much sympathize with it. And on the other hand, um, we have to be careful not to fall back into this, um, um, you could say, um, uh, uh, um, religious, um, uh, uh, religious uh, um, um, respect and and um, uh, for for the author, the composer, the um, uh, uh, virtuoso, or whatever. Um, so. Um, how do we manage to acknowledge the importance of sociality, of collaboration, of collective music making on the one hand? And on the other hand, how do we not um, uh, blur the individual uh, um, agency of, of the singular animal? And, and I think this is really challenging and it's really challenging when it comes to music because there is a whole, you could say, um, political aesthetics behind it. Um, uh, do we think that musical genius is uh, ascribable to one, not one human, but one man, one white man, one white European man um, uh, uh, with, with a um, funny name like Van Beethoven? Um, or, or is it a, a collective uh, product? Um, and is um, Beethoven's uh, um, uh, a sheet and... Um, the feather he writes with and and the instruments uh, around him and his friends and his family and the birds he he listens to when he does his daily uh, uh, walks um, uh, outside of the city uh, are they contributing to his uh, work so so it's like like balancing um, concepts and and on the other hand if we um, only stick to the collective uh, we might overlook that there are uh, musical uh, faculties which are rare, but there. Um, in the last, I would say, 15 years, um, uh, biomusicology has moved from only humans can get into the groove, can entrain to music, can feel the rhythm, can dance and move to the music to um, a lot of other species are able to, but sometimes it's only one individual of this species. There is one, um, uh, there is uh, one bonobo 
uh, which has been like proven scientifically to, to be able to entrain. And we don't know about the others yet. Yeah, I, I just have a follow up question, um, which is, you know, I suppose uh, you, you were earlier saying that, um, in fact, in the natural sciences, um, music of the animals has been studied better. And I'm wondering, uh, related to the response you just gave, if, if what has to be emphasized is the social world of the animal. And um, I, I'm thinking in the natural sciences where the focus is on the animal and what, it, what the animal can do biologically, um, there wouldn't be so much scope to focus on the material practices um, that allow the animal to sing or motivate the animal to sing. So if we were to speculate about the social world and if, we, if you were to um, build the social world of an animal who, can, who has the gift of music, uh, what kind of attributes would you give that? particular animal? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if, if I have um, um, uh, understood the full scope of your question, um, um, but um, uh, my, my um, answer uh, would be um, um, I have um, grave doubts whether um, in a um, lab situation um, there there is even the possibility of of um, uh, of music in in the sense that uh, uh, we normally um, understand when it comes to human music um, uh, most musical situations between humans um, are um, um, uh, without constraint. Uh, if, if we go to a concert, we are free to leave. No one locks the door <laughs> and holds the key. No one straps us to our seats. Uh, no one uh, decides that you don't listen once to a, a piano sonata by Mozart, but 12 hours again and again. Um, so, um, uh, our own social situation normally is one of, you know, freedom and often leisure, or at least uh, it's a relaxed situation. And I have um, a lot of doubts that this is even possible if, if you stage those situations in the lab. It's easy to say for me because I'm a scholar and I'm, 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 I don't do empirical um, uh, uh, studies myself, but, but I think the first thing um, to do would be to, to do what Marek Brandt does with his artistic research. Uh, so do scientific research on animal music in the field and not in the lab and let the animals decide whether they want to take part uh, in this study or not. And, and um, the next thing would be to be to, to familiarize yourself with the soundscape and the, the, the musical like Umwelt um, in, in, in school sense um, um, of, of the animals um, to listen to them to uh, and, and not as a first step start to broadcast our music on them. And, and um, there have been some very interesting uh, steps in these uh, directions. Um, um, there have been studies where um, uh, special music for like cats or um, monkeys has been composed. And I think this, this is a very interesting approach. Um, but um, I, I would say uh, there is a difference between um, this uh, one way street approach to just play music to animals and see how they react and whether they like it or not, or this um, very interesting concept of interspecies music I, I have mentioned, um, where we try to, you know, activate um, uh, um, uh, 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 where, where there is a mutual activation of, of, um, of musical agents and, and um, uh, yeah, relaxing music for dogs, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean, as I said, I'm, I'm no scientist, I don't do empirical work, but, but if I uh, read it right, um, 
there are many pitfalls uh, when it comes to this because sometimes it's just um, that any sound is better than silence or that silence is better than any sound. Um, and um, it, often it depends so much just on the loudness. If you add like 10 or 20 decibel, something, it's the same with, with our listening uh, uh, experiences. Uh, add 30 decibel and something we, we like very much becomes very, very uh, noisy and, and um, unpleasant. Uh, so, um, yeah, um, lots lots of pitfalls there, um, and I I think sometimes it depends more on how how loud uh, um, something is played than whether it sounds relaxing to our uh, to our ears. Yeah, apparently dogs are supposed to like reggae and soft rock as compared as uh, compared to other genres of music, and I wonder how that works out, or whether that works for all dogs, or how one could you know sort of know that uh, with any amount of certainty. Um, uh, we have a question from uh, Rukmini. Um, hey, can you see me and hear me now? No. Hi, so uh, my question, I'm a linguist and um, my questions are really follow-ups on Susan's question. I'd like to begin with a, a teaching example, which I use in my courses, and that is where, it, this is from Queensland in Western Australia, and uh, when the humans went in to the territory with their cell phones, the lyrebirds spontaneously imitated uh, the cell phone ringtones and many different ones. Now, it didn't, the humans didn't go in with an experimental frame of mind to teach the lyrebirds. And the lyrebirds seemed to, and they were more female lyrebirds than male lyrebirds, who seemed to just not use these as signals, but simply to take pleasure in imitation. So I uh, wanted to understand this uh, a little bit about this question of emotion and pleasure in the lyrebird's imitation, apparently spontaneous, of ringtones, but not human voices, which they also heard. But that's just background. I have two questions. One has to do with uh, logocentrism and the idea that uh, human language is different um, in, in a very specific fashion from animal languages in that of the 16 design features of language, duality of patterning is something which human beings have but animals do not. That is, human beings segment words into phonemes and syllables of which they, and words of which they have an intuitive understanding. And then the suprasegmentals, such as tone of voice and, uh, you know, uh, things like if you say, I hate you, baby, uh, mm -hmm. it is much, uh, children don't pay attention to the words, they pay attention to, and if mm -hmm. you say, I love you, baby, or I hate you, baby, children mm -hmm. pay attention to mm -hmm. the suprasegmental patterns, which means that in the formation of meaning, because of the human biological development, it could be that human beings have developed a certain, you know, the hyoid bone is back in the throat and the larynx is shaped in a particular way and so on. But human beings have developed a particular attentiveness to the segmental level, although the suprasegmental level is there. Is the notion of segmentation important at all in understanding the connections between human and animal language. Why is segmentation so important to hu the human species, but not necessarily to other species? And the second question I have, this is a personal question, and I hope you'll forgive me for asking it. It is that, um, you know, I'm, if you look at 
me up. I have nothing to do with social media. I'm never on social media. Susan will tell you this. But if you were to look me up on Wikipedia or somewhere, you would find that I'm described as a poet because I publish. Now, that's not so important. The point is I'm totally, absolutely tone deaf. Mm -hmm. And I cannot actually tell. Uh, you know, you, you could put my head on a chopping block and I would not be able to imitate a musical note or to produce a note. Now, I find that this is many parts on. I wonder, and yet, their political abilities. Now, asking this not as a poet, but as a linguist, how would one understand one's own tone deafness? It's the opposite of the gifted bonobo example. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. non, you know, the non-gifted mm -hmm. human being who is yet able to produce at the segmental level lyrical patterns, but not respond to sound. It's not a family thing because everybody else in my family is musical. I'm not. So uh, I just wondered whether you could throw light on these two uh, questions. Thank you very much. Um, um, Susan Anu, have we got another hour? Because you have touched so many interesting points, uh, even before you started with the two questions. Um, it's, it's really worthwhile to, to um, uh, dive into it. Um, Maybe I start with your second question because I have um, um, I have a theory and I think I'm quite in the mainstream of music psychology. Um, um, uh, I, I meet um, um, a lot of people who tell me they are tone deaf, they have no musical gifts um, and they experience their own musical attempts as um, not satisfying, maybe frustrating, but um, um, uh, a trait of um, a musia uh, as um, really not mm. being able to, to yeah, is, is very, very rare, actually. There are statistics, I don't know them, I don't know the figures, but it's very, very rare. And um, we could say um, uh, that um, maybe as, as the young nightingale um, in her subsong phase, when she was supposed to learn, when she was supposed to, um, to, to, to develop uh, her you know, stuttering, stammering voice into this beautiful nightingale song. Um, and and if, if this doesn't happen out of what reason ever, um, uh, then um, she seems to be not musical at all, but she has the potential. So my theory is that you have musical potential, but you, why ever, didn't develop it. Um, uh, and and um, I think the chopping block wouldn't help, but but um, uh, maybe there are other ways to, you know, raise this potential because otherwise, and that this brings me to your first question, as you said yourself, you you shouldn't and couldn't be able to, to modulate um, uh, um, uh, and, and to, to recognize uh, those uh, voice modulations and those segmentation processes. Um, I, I'm quite fascinated of, um, uh, of uh, biomusicological theories like those posed by Stephen Brown and Tecumseh Fitch who say um, there could have been an early um, evolutionary stage of um, musy language or Brown calls it hmm, with a lot of M's. Yes. Um, and and uh, so you would be an individual which is very, very trained and and very, very well developed on the on the verbal language branch of this um, uh, um, uh, of this, uh, you could say complex, um, but but maybe not as developed on the musical tonal, uh, um, uh, branch and and um, if this was the case in evolutionary history and if it's still the case um, in many animal 
languages. I mean, there have been very interesting publications in the last years, like by Eva Meyer um, on, on animal language and uh, on um, how much of those 16 criteria can be matched by, by animals. Um, um, so I think um, um, the, the tonal aspect, the, the pr prosody of, of um, communication um, obviously is very important to many non-human animals. And as I understand it, as I'm not a linguist, there are many, especially um, not European languages, uh, uh, prosody and uh, tonal aspects are, are very important as well. Um, and this is one of my my critiques of of European music tradition, and it goes together with a critique of um, you could say uh, European language evolution that that it's so fixated on on writing and and reading and um, uh, um, making things uh, 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 readable that that the auditive uh, aspects um, get lost uh, in the process in a way. Can can, can I just say, because I study evolution, that, and I always make this point, that human, human beings developed along their species line, let's say, uh, 100,000 years ago with the hardware, and then 50,000 years yeah. ago, there was a lot of social, social explosion, everybody was talking to each other. But writing developed only 5,000 years ago. So it's very new and it's an unstable evolutionary uh, point. Uh, so, I mean, there are many languages without scripts, but they are all languages, uh, you know, all languages can be interlearned. So, you know, it would take a lot of effort to teach me to sing, but every human being can at the segmental level learn many any other language. So that would be an argument to say that, you know, seg segments are more important because human beings can learn with effort, but they can, it's very, very hard to train them. And it's particularly hard to train them through writing because writing is such a new system. So when you say Europeans kind of uh, sort of like rely on writing, that might just be because writing is so new. Uh, maybe you uh, might end. So writing is a very new invention four or 5,000 years ago, as opposed to 100,000 years of evolution. So do you think that might have something to do with it? Very interesting point, um, and I'm right now reconsidering it. In the end of my um, article, there is this uh, a, a critical uh, um, a perspective on logocentrism, and maybe it's it's kind of a, a, a scriptocentrism I should have uh, critiqued. Um, but actually, my thoughts when I wrote the article went into a, a slightly other direction because. Um, 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 before I um, studied uh, music theory and music history, um, I was a pianist. I'm trained as a pianist. And um, if, if you make music yourself, um, you often experience this, this uh, self-reflective um, well, feeling or thought that you say, um, I'm thinking now, but I'm mm. thinking without words. There, there is an inner logic to what the music does and how I uh, develop uh, the music, um, but I don't need any verbs. I don't need verbal language. And, and this was my point in the article that, that um, mm. if we put less emphasis on this aspect, uh, on this semantic aspect of verbal language and more uh, emphasis on, on um, that, that um, sounding structures can convey meaning as you said, emotions uh, or, or um, expressions uh, of, of a thought and, 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 and um, are a social behavior in itself, then, then we could acknowledge that animals communicate on the sound level um, without seeing it as a deficit that they have no verbal language with a structured a grammar, which is like superimposed on those, uh, you know, melodic, uh, uh, melodic lines. Thank you. 
Um, I, I'm so tempted to, to, to come back to the liar birds uh, you, you mentioned in the beginning of, yes, of, yeah. of your, um, uh, because um, um, uh, I mean, they are, they are great imitators and, and they have been um, uh, involved in interspecies music as well. And when I remember it right, um, it's even a liar bird, um, uh, one liar bird species, which is able to dance to its own song and hmm. to, you know, isolate between the dancing choreography and the, the song um, the uh, uh, structures. It's, it's and um, nevertheless, um, the question you, you um, asked before your first question, um, um, do they, um, uh, do they um, uh, emotionally? Um, pleasure, yeah, do they feel uh, Yeah, do, do they have like, like emotional pleasure? Um, it's so hard if you ask ornithologists yeah. to get an answer to this question. It's, um, I, I, I have um, listened to presentations and papers um, and uh, ornithologists would say um, it's all functional, it's, uh, um, it's uh, for the mating process and they defend their territory, um, check, check, all clear. And if you then uh, um, have the coffee break, we all miss in this uh, Zoom <laughs> pandemic situation, um, then they will start to tell you some anecdotes um, like, ah, oh, I, I listened to this bird and he or she really seemed to enjoy uh, themselves. And, and um, I, I even once um, uh, was told by a very famous uh, a nightingale researcher from Germany that, that he once whistled to a bird in the field and the bird <laughs> whistled back. So they had a musical dialogue. And he said, I could nev never have told this to my colleagues in biology because I would be, you know, um, uh, out of business <laughs> at once. And, and so there's so many anecdotal evidence, even mm -hmm. in the uh, uh, scientific world that they enjoy themselves and that they invest emotionally. And there are some, you know, like, like bird song aesthetics for themselves, but uh, there is, um, actually no research on it because it's you know it's such a slippery slope in the Absolutely. scientific tradition yes well thank you very much i've just finished a big research project on darwin's the expression mm. of emotions in man and the animals so this was very interesting for me um, thank you that's good to hear very nice um I, I had a question about interspecies music, and um, I, I wanted you to tell us a bit about um, what you mean by that. I mean, the way you define it, is it to define music itself as this kind of um, interspecies project with um, conjoined histories, or do you mean also that, do you also, are you suggesting some kind of communication in that definition. And um, I and I thought maybe you could tell us because at the end of the article you end with a set of questions about where you know, this is supposed to take us. And the different options are all like major options for anybody in animal studies. You know, it's like the major options are listed there by you. And since you said you wrote the article a few years back, I wondered if you had arrived at a position or chosen one of them. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, actually, this is uh, a point I, I wanted to raise myself uh, in, in our talk, um, uh, but uh, maybe um, uh, briefly uh, to, to the concept of interspecies music. Um, um, I mean, there are several layers of communication, communication in a, in a semantic sense or communication as, uh, for example, communication of emotional states and emotional developments. So um, th I think there is certainly going uh, some communication going on if the interspecies music happens. But um, um, on the other hand, as we just uh, um, pointed at, we, we know not so much about those non-human aesthetics um, uh, and and we, we for example i touch 
the field of music theory in my article. And I think music theory really has a, a lot, could have a lot to say about animal music. Um, but it has not yet started to apply its methods of analysis to it. Uh, there are branches of uh, uh, musicology like ethnomusicology, um, which has um, adopted a very open and interested stance to animal music. And there are other branches like music theory, which really have, you know, um, um, uh, uh, stayed uh, um, in, in a safe distance from animal music and and so um, um, if we know about the the um, aesthetics uh, of the animals themselves then maybe we we um, in the future can say more about how many aspects of communication are um, in it and I've I've just seen the question in the chat maybe I can I can um, touch it right now because I, I'm very interesting in Gracian Despre and I think she has done beautiful work on animal language and animal communication um, and uh, this uh, reconceptuation of, of the idea of bird song um, uh, that that um, the song um, uh, is not a marker of the territory um, uh, is, is very interesting um, and it goes well together with what I've said about dialects and regions so um, and and umwelten uh, so um, then we have a certain musical culture which is in a way fitted to the to the geography to the to the regional situation of the bird but it's not this um, functional causality, this one-to-one -one, um, uh, uh, situation that um, uh, there is this defined territory and I have to defend it, so I sing. Uh, but but it's a more complex um, it's a more complex interdependence. So thank you very much for for this uh, for this um, uh, 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 hinting at at Despre's work. Um, um, Susan, your, your question, how, how um, have I developed my own standpoint? I, I think which is really missing from the article is the sense of urgency. Um, those questions uh, have, uh, have um, uh, gotten. Um, I'm much more reflecting on um, how fragile those animal music cultures are in the Anthropocene, in the uh, 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 in the ongoing sixth extinction, and in in this uh, you know so dangerous situation uh, um, the, the planet is in, and and um, so I have definitely moved forward to a, um, a more post-humanist um, perspective, um, where um, the question is not so much whether uh, nature is influenced by human culture, but um, from, from the, uh, that there are nature cultures from the start, um, that, um, uh, that it's uh, maybe misleading from the beginning to, to um, construct a categorical divide of, of the natural world from, from the human realm and end that. And uh, this was uh, also in uh, Rukmini's question that media and technology is everywhere. And that maybe the, the songbirds, the lyrebirds choose to imitate not the human voices, but the cell phone sounds. So it's, um, I, I'm right now I'm with Rosie Braidotti and with uh, her concept of media, nature, cultures, because nature, culture and mediality is entangled into each other. But in a situation where we have lots of risk, lots of dangers and, and a lot of, you know, challenges to, to um, not lose um, all those uh, animal songs and uh, um, musical cultures of animals. Um, then, um... If I may maybe ask the question now too. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to say something also, uh, Martin. Reading your article, 
was also really helpful. I mean, besides what you've written about, because it got me curious into the whole question of what the animal means or might have meant for music in India in the Indian context, which is something that I was absolutely unaware of, um, not being from the field field of musicology at all. And um, I got talking to some people and uh, it's really fascinating because I realized, and you're probably aware of this also, uh, the seven swaras, the uh, seven musical notes and the successive steps of the octave in Hindustani classical music are believed to be inspired by animal sounds. So, you know, the sare, gamma, pa, uh, the thing that we have in, um, as the basis of all music whereby the sa is supposed to be uh, based on the peacock's call in the monsoon, the re is the bellowing of a cow calling out to her calf and so on. So it's, uh, you know, the, the sound or the call of one animal that is supposed to have inspired one of the notes each. And given that all the ragas in Hindustani classical music are made up of these seven basic notes, basically one could say that all human music in this tradition is inspired by animals, which is, uh, uh, which again, as we said, um, in academic circles would not be something that would probably come up all that much. I also um, got interested and curious to know um, what else was going on. And I realized that there had been someone called A.J. Mitra, who is credited uh, with being the first and perhaps the only Indian, um, because he went out with a cell phone and he recorded bird sounds, um, animal sounds and frog sounds in particular um, in the time period from 2008 until 2014, which is when he died. And uh, using this, he, um, he was a teacher of music in uh, Chennai. So he used this to get his students interested in nature and in um, all the forms of music that were to be found in nature, including animal music. And I thought that was really wonderful, but also something that was not widely known. Um, so thank you for <laughs> uh, getting me and I'm sure other people in our context interested in the idea of, um, of animal music and in trying to discover how that has worked in our own cultural context. Um, I had one last question um, and that pertains or actually two questions which both pertain to the term species specific music, which you've written about in your article. So um, my first question would be um, on the lines of, um, uh, for those of us who are not very familiar with it, uh, would you please elaborate how this works? Because from what I could read, species specific music works in very different way for different species. So for cats, uh, from what I could understand, it is composed of lines based on cat vocalizations like uh, purring and then using frequencies similar to the feline vocal range. For dogs, however, uh, people tend to use, like we said earlier, reggae and soft rock and not others. And then we said elephants, people play Bach and uh, Chopin on piano. So how does one determine um, what is specific to which species? And then my second question was, um, if we speak about species specific music and creating species specific music and playing it for non-human animals, don't we kind of risk falling into the trap of anthropocentrism and human exceptionalism and saying, and assuming that we as humans have the right and the capability to determine what is specific to which species? Mm, yeah, very worthwhile. Um, um, th this concept of a species-specific music, I, I think you described it quite well, Anu, that, that um, um, uh, you can um, look for the, um, uh, for the hearing thresholds, um, for the frequencies. Um, a certain species uh, are able um, uh, to detect uh, for their own vocalizations or instrumental sounds uh, for the for the um, uh, timbre of of their sounds and then um, use this um, for um, uh, recombining or or um, uh, creating new music um, and um, the other at attempt would be a, you could say a trial and error attempt there have been studies where 
many different human musics have been played to the same animals. And then it goes like, okay, um, heavy metal, no, don't like it. Um, uh, classical uh, Viennese music, Mozart or Beethoven, no, um, prefer silence. Um, uh, African music, um, oh, they seem to like it. And again, we have this curious um, biases and presuppositions by the human scientists who seem to think that music from Africa or from India, there is also a study um, by Franz de Waal and others about Indian music and I think orangutans, um, uh, uh, chimpanzees, sorry. Uh, this this uh, curious bias that music from Africa or India is like more natural or more um, whatever um, and and should appeal uh, uh, to animals. So um, lots of pitfalls there as well. And yes, in a way, you I think you are right that that we risk to to be anthropocentric. On on the other side, um, um, in the last years, there has been a lot of I think very constructive and fruitful um, discourse on benign anthropomorphism. On, on um, that, that it's not inherently wrong to project um, our feelings, um, our um, uh, social interaction on other animals, um, but that we just have to be careful with that. So I think, um, uh, um, yes, dismantle anthropocentrism and avoid to, you know, um, to, to um, uh, control or even oppress animals by music. I'm totally with you. Um, but on the other hand, um, um, we can be open to the idea that um, uh, it's possible that if we like it, uh, they like it too. Because the other way around uh, so often is obviously the case. The nightingales like it and we like it too when they sing. So, um, so uh, um, careful and benign anthropomorphism um, uh, could be uh, um, could be uh, a quite fruitful and constructive approach if if we um, watch our steps um, uh, when when we move forward. Uh, but yes, um, an, an anthropocentric and and an approach which in the end just proves again that humans are so exceptionally um, would certainly be the wrong way uh, when it comes to music. Totally agree. Yeah, I've heard the same um, sort of argument or on the same lines about anthropomorphism also to say it need not be seen per se as something evil or, you know, to be rejected outright because if we say that uh, they are like us, then, you know, by a reverse argument, we're also saying we're like them. So then it's not only sort of um, imposing something or problematic, but that it can be a, a useful tool, so to speak, for engaging with the animal other, for understanding and so on. So yeah. Um, with that, I think we have to stop for today, Martin. Thank you so, so much for your generosity in making the time and your patience and uh, uh, for all your wonderful answers to all the questions that we've posed. I'm sure that all those of us who have been here have benefited from this really a lot. I have for sure. Um, thanks a lot. And I wish everybody a good evening or a good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are in the world right now. And I hope to see you again next time at the next table uh, talk that we will be organizing soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.